السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله رب العالمين all praise is indeed due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his household, his companions, may Allah bless them all, may Allah bless every one of us, grant us all forgiveness during this beautiful night of Ramadan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala write our names from those who have achieved freedom from hellfire. And may Allah keep us steadfast. Amin. My brothers and sisters, you and I know that some generations back, we were perhaps not Muslim. Someone happened to work on us or care for our forefathers or someone up the ladder in such a way that they accepted Islam or in the case of those who have reverted you have accepted Islam because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had it not been for the interaction of the Muslims perhaps a lot of people would not have accepted Islam so there is a misunderstanding that people are trying to peddle today that we are not allowed to interact with the non-Muslims and we are not allowed to befriend them in any way this is actually taken totally out of context from the Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us strength. In Surah Al-Mumtahina, verse number 8 and 9, Allah makes clear and it's very logical. It has to be logical. Whom you are not allowed to get very close with. Those are the enemies who have driven you out of your homes and who have fought you. Those are the ones whom you keep your distance from. And I'm sure any parent would give exactly the same advice to his or her children, whether they were Muslim or not. If someone has harmed you, they were attacking you, you know that they do not have good intentions towards you. You would tell your children, please don't associate with these because they are your enemies. As for those who may not be Muslim, but they have never harmed you. They have never attacked you. They have never caused any damage to you. There is no harm, obviously, in being good to them. In fact, you have to be good to them, kind and just. And you may be close to them as well. In fact, to the degree that the Quran has verses in it that permit under conditions the marriage to a person of the book a Jew or a Christian woman a Jewish or a Christian woman if the enmity was so severe do you really think that Allah would have allowed marriage in a way that you are intimate with the person and you have children with them and they grow up to subhanallah so we need to put these verses into context by going back to the verses of Surah Al-Ma'idah 51 and 56 and taking a look at Surah Al-Mumtahina where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم Allah does not prohibit you from befriending those from among the non-Muslims who have never fought you they have never driven you out of your homes etc Allah says he does not stop you you have to be good to them kind to them you have to fulfill their rights etc but the very next verse Allah says إِنَّمَا يَنْهَاكُمُ اللَّهُ عَنِ الَّذِينَ قَاتَلُوكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ وَأَخْرَجُوكُمْ مِنْ دِيَارِكُمْ وَظَاهَرُوا عَلَىٰ إِخْرَاجِكُمْ أَنْ تَوَلَّوْهُمْ The term wilaya is used. Wilaya does not just translate as friendship. It is a very high level of protection where you seek the protection of someone. Subhanallah. And Perhaps it is beyond the level of mere friendship. So Allah says, indeed, Allah has prohibited you from taking as protectors those who have fought you. They have driven you out of your homes and they have assisted others to drive you out of your homes. You cannot afford to become so close to them because you will not be able to save yourself from harm. Subhanallah.
So to save ourselves from harm, and that's the series that we are speaking about, we need to save ourselves from befriending those who are not sincere towards us, those who have fought us, those whom we have had a major issue with that is not resolved. Be careful. Because if you are not careful, you are going to have a problem. But we should never ever interpret the verse to say that we are not allowed to associate or befriend those who are good from amongst the non-Muslims. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding of who we were a few generations back and sometimes even us who have accepted Islam reverted where were we some time back a lot of the times it has to do with the interaction with the Muslims take a look at Far East Asia and how Islam spread there in a beautiful way may Allah grant us an understanding the next surah surah number 61 is surah to saf and I've chosen one verse from that surah where Allah speaks to us and Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon kabura maqtan indallahi an taquluu ma la taf'aloon O you who believe, why do you say that which you do not do? This is verse number two of the surah. Why do you say one thing and do another thing? That is a very big sin in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say something and to be something else. Hypocrisy. My brothers and sisters, we need to save ourselves from being hypocrites. What you see is what you get. That's how it should be. Not that we are a front and inside we are something else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from hypocrisy. The signs of a hypocrite, those whom when they speak, they lie. When they promise, they break their promise. And when they are in a dispute, they get so angry that they explode. Allah says those are signs of a, hip, of a hypocrite. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us truthful people. Those whom when we promise, we fulfill the promise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Then we move on to the next beautiful surah. It is named after the Jumu'ah. Jumu'ah is the most blessed day of the week. It is the Eid of the Muslims. Jumu'ah is actually a day of celebration, subhanallah. In it, there is a moment that Allah says through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to us, if you were to make a dua at that particular hour, and we don't know the precise hour, there is a lot that has been made mention of. Some say it is when the imam is up between the two khutbahs. Some say it is after salatul asur, etc. At that time, if you were to make dua, it is accepted. So chances are, if you repeat the dua every moment of the day throughout the whole of a Friday, you will definitely get that moment somewhere, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. But what is important for us to know is Allah says in verse number 9 of that surah, which is surah 62, surah al-Jum'ah, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمُعَةِ فَاسْعَوْا إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَذَرُوا الْبَيْعِ O oh, you who believe, when the caller has called, or when the call is called for the Jumu'ah prayer, abandon and leave all your business and rush, make haste towards the remembrance of Allah. Go and listen to what the Imam has to say. It is your dose of a message that will shake you, move you, so that you can continue for the rest of that week, inshallah, in the remembrance of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The difficulty is, we come late for Salatul Jumu'ah. That's a difficulty. Do you know there is a competition every Friday where the hadith says, إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ الْجُمُعَةِ وَقَفَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ عَلَى بَابِ الْمَسْجِدِ يَكْتُبُونَ الْأَوَّلَ فَالْأَوَّلَ فَإِذَا خَرَجَ الْإِمَامْ طَوَوْ صُحُفَهُمْ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الذِّكْرِ the hadith says, on a Friday, the angels stand at the doors of the masajid, writing down who comes first, who comes next, who comes after that, etc. In order, who wins the competition, subhanallah. When the imam comes up and starts his khutbah, they close their book and they come and listen to the lecture as well. How many of us, we arrive in Jumu'ah, we might have technically fulfilled the farad, but our name was not in that particular book mentioned in this hadith, subhanallah. Because we came after the imam already started. Brothers and sisters, let's save ourselves from the wrath of Allah. Let us earn the mercy of Allah by coming on a Friday early to the masjid. Sit, read your sunnah, read a little bit of Quran. Do that which will earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Come early. It's a blessing. It's a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make us proud of our days that have been given as a gift by Allah to us. May Allah make us those who give importance to Jumu'ah. Remember, when you give importance to that which Allah has given importance to, you have earned the pleasure of Allah. 
You give importance to what Allah gave importance to, it is a sign of taqwa, God consciousness. Allah says that those who consider the sanctuaries of Allah as absolutely sacred, it is a sign of the taqwa of the heart. It is a sign of the piety of the heart. You consider the Quran sacred. You consider the Ramadan sacred. The Hajj is sacred. The Masajid are sacred. The Friday is sacred, etc., etc. It's a sign that you are close to Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us close to Him. We move on to... Uh, another verse in the same surah where Allah speaks about how some people give preference to their businesses over the Jumu'ah. Now remember, when the call is called for the Jumu'ah, those whom the Jumu'ah is farad upon, they are the ones who have to go for the Jumu'ah. If you have someone working who's not a Muslim and perhaps they are running the uh, business that you have and it is open through the Jumu'ah, many Muslims would prefer to close it down. But if you had to leave it for as long as there is no one operating it, who is supposed to be at the Jumu'ah? Bi'ithnillah, you've done nothing wrong. You've done nothing wrong. However, Allah says, قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ مِّنَ اللَّهْوِ وَمِنَ التِّجَارَةِ O Muhammad wasallam, tell them, what Allah has is far better than the, the past time and the tijara, the business that they are pursuing. So, Quit the business, cut it, chop it, drop it, go to Allah. What Allah has is far better than what that business can offer you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and grant us goodness. I also call on myself and yourselves. Eid is around the corner, inshallah. May Allah give us the opportunity to see the Eid. Amen. Please arrive very early for the Eid. It happens only twice a year. And we come late. We don't even listen to what's going on. Please arrive very early. Dress properly and Come with lots of happiness. It's a day of happiness. Come and read some Quran prior to the Eid. Sit in your safs. Inshallah, that's just a word of encouragement because I notice everyone sometimes on the day of Eid rushing last minute. Why is that the case? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Then we have the next surah, Surah Al-Munafiqun, which is surah number 63. I want to pick up one or two verses from the surah. The first one is, a sign of hypocrisy, we were speaking about hypocrisy just now, is that whenever someone is saying something, they feel that this person is attacking me. Subhanallah. The Imam gets up and he says, don't commit adultery. Because you just committed adultery, you say, he's talking about me. Well, if that's the case, you are guilty. That's why you think he's talking about you. Because you are guilty. If you were not guilty, you wouldn't think of it that way. If the imam gets up and says, you mustn't yell, you mustn't scream, you mustn't swear. And you know five minutes ago you were swearing. Automatically, you are going to feel that hey, he's talking about me. Why? There's hypocrisy. That's the reason. That's the reason. So Allah says in the Quran, verse number four of Surah Al-Munafiqun, يَحْسَبُونَ كُلَّ صَيْحَةٍ عَلَيْهِمْ the hypocrites, any scream that they hear, they think it's all about them. They think that this person is referring to them. And you know what's the reason? Because they are guilty. That's why. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from this. And remember when people say things, a lot of the times it's from Allah. They don't even know you sometimes. And they are saying that which you think is directed only at you. Yes, yet it is a common message for everyone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Another verse of that surah is verse number nine, where Allah asks us to save ourselves. From what? From becoming so engrossed in our wealth and our children that we forget Allah. So Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tulhikum amwalukum wa la awladukum an dhikrillah. O you who believe, never let your wealth or your children divert you from remembering Allah. While you're busy in your businesses or on the social with your family, you don't forget your salah. You don't forget the fact that you're a Muslim. You don't forget halal and haram because you should know that that comes first. So you can enjoy, you can do your business, you can spend time with your family. But the condition being made mention of here is don't forget Allah. Don't compromise Allah just because you're on a holiday. It's fine. I can do it. It's okay. We're on holiday. You are not on holiday for being a worshiper of Allah. There's no holiday in that regard. <laughs> what if you were to die in that condition? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Then we move on to another surah, surah at talaq surah 65 of the Quran. 
I want to draw your attention to the reward of the consciousness of Allah. In this surah, Allah talks about divorce. Brothers and sisters, save yourselves from divorcing wrongly by learning the rules and regulations governing divorce. Many times when there is a nikah, we are invited, mashallah, to officiate or to attend. People ask us to talk. I always feel in my heart, let me talk about divorce. Because the people don't know much about the rules and regulations about divorce. And then I think to myself, imagine getting up at someone's wedding and talking about divorce. They're going to think this guy is crazy, man. Subhanallah. So therefore, we don't talk about it. I think it's important that we actually address this issue. And we deal with it. Before you marry, please learn about what divorce is. Because people divorce without realizing what they've done. Anyway, getting to the point, verse number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whoever is conscious of Allah. Taqwa means to bear Allah in mind, to be conscious of Allah, to be having the piety that is needed of a mu'min. If you have that, Allah says, we will grant you a way out. When you think that there was no way out, Allah will give you a way out. Subhanallah. Allah says, we will crack open that closed place in a way that you will have a makhraj. A makhraj means a place to come out. Subhanallah. And Allah says, we will sustain you from a place that you didn't imagine we would have sustained you from. يَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ Allah will grant him sustenance in a way that he didn't dream of it. He didn't imagine it. So be steadfast. When you are steadfast, you worship Allah, it's only a matter of time before your problems are solved. We become impatient. Take a look at the prophets of Allah. All of them. Yusuf alayhi salam, he was very patient. At the end, he was victorious. Musa alayhi salam, very patient. At the end, he was victorious. Ayyub alayhi salam, very patient. At the end, he was victorious. Yunus alayhi salam, very patient. At the end, he was victorious. With us, we want victory without the patience. That's the problem. Ask yourself, who did Allah love more? Myself or the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam? The answer is Yusuf alayhi salam. How many years did he have to wait? Approximately 40 years according to some narrations. Well, I haven't even waited four months and I'm giving up on Allah. Astaghfirullah. Look at how weak we've become. Let's save ourselves by being patient, my brothers and sisters. Alhamdulillah. And the verses continue. Allah says, whoever is conscious of Allah, he will make matters easy for him over a matter of time. Yaja'allahu min amrihi yusra. Verse number four. Whoever is conscious of Allah, Allah will make his affairs easy. And in, in the next verse, Allah says, Whoever is conscious of Allah, Allah will grant him increase in reward. Allah will recompense or expiate his sins. So Allah will delete your sins as a result of your sabr. When you are patient, what happens? Allah wipes out other sins that have happened in your life. Because you are patient for the sake of Allah. So be patient. Your status is being elevated. We hear this, but in fact it is in the Quran. Substantiated by verses of Surah At-Talaq. So therefore, be patient. Allah knows your struggle. Allah knows your difficulty. Allah knows what you are in. And Allah has the solution. But His delay in giving you that is for your benefit so that you can earn greater reward. If He were to just give it to you as soon as you raised your hands, perhaps you may not get closer to Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us closeness to Him. Amen. Move on to the next surah. Surah At-Tahreem. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses us and these verses are very important regarding saving ourselves. Listen to verse number six, straight into our theme. Oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your family members from the fire. Then Allah describes the fire, how burning it is, how hot it is, how its fuel is made up of man and rock. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So Allah says it straight to us, save yourselves from the fire. How? By doing what? By obeying his instruction, abstaining from his prohibition and seeking his forgiveness. So therefore, verse number eight, after that Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu tubu ilallahi tawbatan nasuha. 
O you who believe, turn to Allah. Return to Allah in repentance in a sincere and genuine way. In that way, Allah will forgive your sins and he will grant you paradise. Because when Allah says, O you who believe, save yourselves from the fire, many people might think I've already done things that are so bad, they are deserving of the fire. So immediately Allah says, no, if you seek forgiveness, you will save yourself. So therefore, my brothers and sisters, no matter what you've done, where you've been, how much you've done, Remember, Allah's mercy is far broader than your sin or whatever you have done in the past. Subhanallah. Allah's mercy encompasses whatever you've done. It needs you to realize that the date of change is today, not tomorrow. It needs you to realize that I need to turn to Allah. You need to cut your bad ways and habits and say, Oh Allah, here I come, subhanallah. Here I come. I'm going to try my best, Ya Allah. I've quit my bad ways and habits. I regret them. Forgive me. Grant me a new beginning, Ya Allah. And Allah will grant you that beginning. It's the mercy of Allah. My brothers and sisters, don't ever lose hope in this beautiful mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 11 makes mention of something very, very interesting. And that is, sometimes you have a person who is religious and their children sometimes... You find one or two or more or less may not be so religious. So people say, look at that guy. Isn't he so and so's son? Subhanallah. I tell you, it has happened even to the messengers of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about it in this surah. Surah Al-Tahreem, surah number 66 of the Quran. Verse number 10 and 11. Allah says, ضرب الله مثلا للذين كفروا امرأة نوح وامرأة لوط. Allah gives you the example of the wife of the Prophet Nuh, Noah, who was a disbeliever, and the wife of the Prophet Lut, alayhi salam, she was also a disbeliever. Allah says, we, they were the wives of two of our slaves, but it did not help them in the eyes of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point being raised here is, we need to work ourselves in our connection with Allah to the degree that when we meet him, we have acts of worship that inshallah will come to our rescue through the mercy of the same Allah. So do deeds at least. Do good deeds and have hope in the mercy of Allah. Man sama ramadana imanan wahtisaban. min Whoever fasts in the month of Ramadan with full conviction, expecting a reward from Allah, Allah says, all their sins will be forgiven by us. We know Allah promised you something. You can hold Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to question, to say, Oh Allah, you promised me. Where is it? But we know that we depend on the mercy of Allah. If it was not for the mercy of Allah, we wouldn't, we wouldn't even be here tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us from his mercy. So we move on to the next surah, surah al-mulk. Powerful surah. Many of us read it quite often. In it, again, Allah makes mention of the fact that he is more concerned about the quality of your deed than the quantity of it. Remember that. So if you are to fulfill, say you are reciting the Quran. If you did not finish the entire khatam in the month of Ramadan, but you read beautifully, slowly, you took your time, you couldn't rush because you are slow and you only covered 10 chapters. You will have a greater reward by far than the one who whizzed through the entire Quran. No concentration, no proper pronunciation, no nothing. They just wanted to get done with it. Allah says, hang on. You don't realize we don't need your act of worship. You need it. So deal with the quality, not with the quantity. Yes, the farad, we have no option. We have to deal with both the quality and the quantity. But anything beyond that farad, it's always to do with the quality more than the quantity. And the evidence of it is verse number two of Surah Al-Mulk, which is Surah number 67 of the Quran. Allah says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا It is he who created death and life in order to test you who from amongst you has better deeds. Did you hear that? Who has better deeds? He didn't say who has more deeds. He says, who has better deeds? Therefore, let's save ourselves from misunderstanding this by doing good deeds that are accepted in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. Speaking about the Quran, there is a hadith that says a person who can flow and recites the Quran beautifully. Yes, mashallah, they have a very high rank. You know, they will have a very high rank with those who are pious, etc. But the one who reads the Quran with a ta'ta, -ta, you know what's a ta'ta? -ta? That means you are like stuttering, you, you are slow, and you, you're not as flowing as mashallah, the Imam of the Haram, etc. Allah says through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, falahu ajran. Such a person will have a double reward. What is the reward? The reward for trying. It's not so easy. The reward for the recitation and the reward for the struggle. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Look at the mercy of Allah. So if you're taking time and you're struggling, you actually have a double reward. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us from his mercy. Then we move on to Surah Noon. Surah number 68 of the Quran, where Allah describes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's character. Allah Himself is speaking about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Verse number four, and Allah says, Wa innaka la ala azim. Indeed, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are upon the highest level of character and conduct. Highest level. From that verse, we learn that we have to go back, study this character and conduct of the greatest of prophets, the most noble of all, and the greatest of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we need to emulate. We need to learn. We need to follow. We need to put into practice. We need to actually study every aspect of his character, his conduct, his life, his statements, and we need to learn from it. Because Allah himself declares that this subhanallah messenger, his character is on a very, very high level. May Allah make us from those who can take from the character of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Indeed, we have been blessed, my beloved brothers and sisters. I move on to Surah Al-Haqqah, which is Surah number 69 of the Quran. In this Surah, Allah makes mention of a day that every one of us will have to witness. It is a day when we will be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will be answering whatever we've done. And after that, we will be given our book of deeds. We will be given our book of deeds. Just like children who are waiting for their results from a school exam, we will be waiting for our results. Each one worried about himself. You know, when the results are out at a school or a university or a college and they are up, perhaps on the uh, notice board or somewhere, each one goes there to look at whose results. The first thing you've got to do is worry about yourself. As soon as you see your name, that you are from amongst those who passed, there is something that happens to you, especially when the examination was so difficult. Or you know it was crucial. It, was, it meant you going further in life or stopping and perhaps something else happens. And you looked and said, hey, subhanallah, I'm so excited. And you know, the jumping and masha, people react differently. Some become hysterical. Some, they would drop into sujood for the sake of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least the minimum for us, say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, related to Allah. You know, with all your yes and everything else, subhanallah, everyone is worried about his own result first. Imagine on the day of judgment, standing, waiting for the results and the book comes out. And as the book is coming out, it's going to be given to you and to me. May Allah grant us the best. I mean, that book, as soon as it's being given to you, it will either be given to you right hand or the left hand. Immediately you would know what has happened. It's like a sign Allah tells you here in the Quran. And this is amazing. Verse number 19 of al haqqa And it is repeated a few times in the Quran in different wording. As for the one who gets his book in the right hand, he will say, Subhanallah. 
Hey, he's going to be so excited. That's the term used in the Quran. Read my book, check, check my results. Like a little child looking at the parents and saying, Subhanallah, check my results. Look what I did, Dad. I did well. On that day, it's not about mom and dad. It's about your own excitement. You're worried about yourself. And Allah says, the one who will be given his book or her book on the right hand or in the right hand will say, hey, look at my results. Subhanallah. Ha. Read them. Iqra'u kitabiyah. Read my book. Check what I did. Mashallah, I passed. May Allah make us from those. What a beautiful description it is. Absolutely amazing. When we think of it, Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, as we are listening to this verse, we seek Allah's forgiveness because we know it's the mercy of Allah. Allah can wipe out our sins in a flash. May Allah grant that to us. But then there is the other side of it. Verse number 50, 25, a few verses down. Allah says, as for the one who will be given the book in the left hand, he will say, I wish I hadn't been given my book at all. I wish I didn't have this book here today. I wish I didn't know what my results were. I wish I was dead today. May Allah not make us from those. This is a very, very vivid description of what's going to happen on that day of judgment. And my brothers and sisters, to help yourselves, and to save ourselves from the torment or from getting the book on the wrong hand or in the wrong hand, we need to make sure we've sought the forgiveness of Allah. Ask Allah's forgiveness. Keep on asking Allah's forgiveness. I promise you it will help you. Don't think, hey, but I can't remember having sinned. No, go and ask Allah's forgiveness every day. Whenever you remember, oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me. And you will notice, inshallah, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all.